faves to do. Um, oh, what if, if any of you, uh, my name is Simon, it's on Google Class or the Google Docs. But if any of you prefer a paper copy, like you do have to have the internet, you have to use the website. But if you'd rather write down your response instead of typing your response, you can have a paper copy. So is there anyone that wants a paper copy? Okay. So after the War of 1812, go back to the War of 1812, we just did the Civil War, but this unit, it kind of starts before the Civil War and it ends after the Civil War, so we're in a large chunk of time. But the War of 1812, okay, after James Monroe becomes president, and he coins a term called Manifest Destiny. All right, what's your destiny? What does that mean? What? Like, what's your meant to do? So anyone know, like, a synonym for destiny? Yeah, fate. There we go, guys. All right, like your fate. What's your, what's your destined? Okay, what you're meant to be. What you're meant to do. Well, in the U.S. after the War of 1812, the U.S. focused on our destiny in our country in the 1800s was to span from the Atlantic Ocean to the Pacific Ocean. So they believed we're supposed to go from sea to shining sea. No, it's not going to be easy because there's some other people that live in different parts of this land that have been there for generations. But the presidents and the Americans say it's our manifest destiny, meaning God has willed it. God has determined that we need to go from sea to sea. And so this is the most famous image from the 1800s to depict this. Um, most museums you go to, if they're covering the era of the 1800s, this painting or like this reproducible would be there. Most textbooks is gonna have this picture. So what's happening is this is manifest destiny. You have settlers that are heading west to the Pacific Ocean, or think of like we know of as like Oregon, California. And what's guiding them west? Where, who's the light? What's the light represent the person? And an angel. Yes, an angel. God will guide the settlers. And you see like this light is guiding this, this woman, this angel is guiding the settlers. And then what's driving out? The settlers are driving out the buffalo that would get in their way or the natives that would get in their way. Now it's not going to be that easy, but God will the U.S. to be from sea to sea. And like also when you look at this, you might be like, um, wait, the train track stops. Well, it's because when this was like painted, the Transcontinental Railroad wasn't done yet. I mean, there wasn't a railroad going across the entire United States yet. But when they build it, when it keeps going, again, God will protect all that are heading to the West, all Americans. Okay, again, it's not going to really be this easy. So we're going to start notes. And I'm going to start off notes with your essay question. This is going to be the question that you are going to have on your test. So you can write it down. That way, when you take your test, it's not a big shocker. I don't expect you to know. What you're going to answer right now, okay, that's the point of like learning, but you already might have an idea, which is also fine, okay, but I hope by the end of this unit, you're going to at least have a thought process of how you'd like to answer this. So the question that's going to be the essay question on your test is, was the United States expansion to the West, to the Pacific Ocean, was it the fulfillment of our country's destiny. So like, was it manifest destiny? Or was it a hostile takeover of lands that were already claimed by others? So was it our destiny? Was it fate? Was it bound to happen? Did it have to happen? Okay. Or would you consider history as it being a hostile takeover of lands already claimed by others? There's not a right or a wrong way to answer this. So some of you are going to say this. Some of you are going to say this, and some of you are going to get it right, even though you answered it different than someone else, and that person's going to get it right. Okay, it's your opinion. 
you gotta have an educated opinion with logic, okay? Like reasons as to why you believe the way you do. So hopefully things that you learn in class. So I'll let you write that down. And then while you're writing, raise your hand if you have a sibling. Okay, raise your hand if you have little siblings. Okay, all right. For those that don't have siblings, use your imagination, all right? Everyone else still use your imagination because maybe it's never happened at your house. So here's what you're gonna think about is, let's say uh, you just get the, the newest gaming console, like the newest Xbox or PlayStation, okay? You get the latest and the greatest. And you're sitting here at school, you're not really thinking about and listening to what I'm saying because you're so excited to get home and, and just play your video games or play the game. So you get home and one of your siblings beats it to it and they're gaming instead. But you really, really want to play. So I want you to think about first, don't say it out loud, what would you do to get the gaming console from your sibling? All right, what approach do you take? So, Mary, what do you do? Well, I ask them. Okay, you're gonna ask. Possibly. Okay, what if what if I they say no? Then I just take it. Mary, what is? Uh, seniority rules. Oh, okay. Gaming challenge. You, I bet you pull that card a lot because did you get it pulled on you yeah, growing up? All the time. Seniority, and then if that doesn't work, you're just gonna take it. Yeah. Like, how do you do? How do you take? How do you take it? Just take it, and then if they come after you, then you go after them. And then oh, wait, 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 wait. So now you're saying like you're going to use violence? Yeah. <laughs> yes. If you really want it, then I guess. That's All good. right. Because the current household, Mary gets <laughs> after it. Violence, <laughs> <Right>. gracious. <laughs> Guy, what would you do? <laughs> oh, okay, but you really want to play. Aw, you're just wasting that chance. Elijah? Oh, man. Okay, you're going to use some persuasion. I used to use that with my little brother all the time. Uh, I would actually guilt him into why, which there's another way, like persuasion, which would be like guilt. I was like, oh, but I've had a hard day, you know, and then make him feel really bad. Or when I wanted to go do something for me, I'd be like, I'm going to time you. And now he's 28 years old, and I still say that. Like, we go, I'll find him, and he's just like, no. Uh, what about you? Um, I would first ask, but then he said no, I don't want to check his grade. So if you're gonna... <laughs> <laughs> no, I wouldn't tell on him, I'd tell him check his grade. Okay, so, all right. Um, how do, yeah, how would, how would I put that? You wouldn't, so it's not tattling, you would, oh. Yeah, blackmail? Oh, I like that. That's dirty. Blackmail. Okay. Jeez. Yeah. Aubrey? I was going to say, oh, like, um, like if um, you've been on it for five minutes, I'll take the next, I'll take five minutes. All right. And you, you older siblings, you have that luxury. Like three hours. Right. Yeah. <laughs> I get three hours and you can play for three hours. <laughs> anything so anything else hours. besides this? Anything? I got one more. Okay, that this is back in the day of like old video games. Is if we would just like turn off and turn it back on. So like then you see they they lose where they were their spot in the level. Okay, that's something that um I would call like sabotage. Like or or we used to like if my brother had the remote and I wanted, I would go stand in front of like the part. Yeah, the sensor. Yeah, that thing. I would go stand in front so then he couldn't do. Anything? Yeah. Oh, because Kaden wants to try to rule, huh? Yeah. Oh, oh, he's never been. Is that not? Yeah, Zach. We had a cat. Yeah. So it's touched. It's touched the button. The sensory cat. Yeah. So we had a cat. And we had a laser pointer. We pointed at the thing, and the cat would try to help. Oh <laughs> my word! No, that is like so laziness bad. to a whole new level. <laughs> was, That's very clever. It was funny. <laughs> That's good. I like that. Try. Oh yeah. So like, how would you compete? Like, okay, so it's, it's competing at this level. Oh. Whoa. 
Yeah, all right, a little competition. All right, I'm going somewhere with this. So almost everything that you kids came up with are tactics or strategies that the US used against Native Americans to take their land or get their land. Because it wasn't an Xbox, but the Native Americans were on the land that the US wanted. So like asking, yes. And the seniority thing, well, you know, the natives have been there longer, so that one doesn't totally work. However, they would use the logic of God wants us to, like it's our destiny. That one didn't use to work too well um, with the natives. Sometimes they would take it, sometimes they would use violence, which we're going to cover some of those. They would use persuasion, they would use guilt. They would, the blackmail, was, it wasn't quite as, as bad as what you think, but you're going to see a little bit of that in the movie when we watch it. Okay, come up with compromises. There would be treaties. There would be sabotage, definitely. Um, and competition was usually violence. There's a battle would be the competition. So, okay, the next slide is a slide that we're gonna spend, well, not this one. Um, okay, I'm gonna cover this up because I don't want you guys to write everything down at once. It's gonna be way too much writing. We're gonna, basically gonna spend most of the day on writing one slide of notes. What I wanna show you first though is, this was Native American territory of like Oklahoma, which Oklahoma, like Minnesota, is very rich in Native American heritage. This was Native American territory in 1885. All right, so just take a look. You can see like Arkansas, Kansas, Texas. All right. Now, this is Native American territory in 1891. Did it get smaller or bigger? 1885 to six years, 1891. Got smaller because now you see Arkansas, Texas, Kansas. Now this chunk says territory of Oklahoma. That means it's US territory. It's no longer Native American territory. So this in 1891 is Native American territory. What I should pull up and find for you is a map of Oklahoma today and what the Native American territories look like today. It's much smaller um, today where they do have, they still have tribes like we do here in Minnesota. They still have tribal land. Yeah. Yes. In, um, uh, Lake Calhoun in Minneapolis, they changed. And I asked my, I don't, I don't know how to say it. I always, my brother, he runs around Lake Calhoun like almost every morning. And I was like, how do you say the name of that? Um, Cause I always forget. Cause when you read it, it's like Obagashima or you know, something like that. I don't know how to, I don't know how to say it. So I always make him say, or, I don't know. So anyway, I should all ask him again. How do you say that? So yeah, they, we've changed a lot of things in Minnesota back to the native names. Minnesota is, yeah, mm -hmm, exactly, our state. This is, so we're gonna start really in the 1860s with our first battle next week. Um, so this is the land lost by native tribes up until 1850. We're gonna get into, we're gonna focus, because we're in Minnesota, we're gonna start in Minnesota um, in the 1860s. So one slide today, all you have to write down is we're going to look at the differences between the Native American concept or perspective of warfare versus the white man's concept or perspectives of warfare. Because the US thinks differently about the purposes of battles and war and how you do it than the natives do. The natives have been at war, they fought for centuries. Okay, they're not all peaceful tribes, they fought against each other because Sometimes they would get into skirmishes while hunting, you know, or over, when I, when I say over land, it's not necessarily this is my land, this is your land, but it would be when they're both trying to settle in the same spot, maybe for like a winter or a summer, that's when they would fight, okay? But like, they had no word for ownership of land. Like that didn't exist, like it does for all of us. So because you have different perspectives, there's going to be misconceptions. Um, the US is gonna get really freaked out at times by some of the things that the natives do, but I want you to kind of understand why they did it. 
okay? And kind of the history behind it. So we're gonna write number one and number two right now. You don't need to write the stuff in blue. That's extra. Okay, the blue don't write down because you're gonna you're gonna know this. It's more of a reminder of like, oh yeah, I should tell you guys that. So we're gonna start with the Native American concept of warfare. To Native Americans, warfare was the most brave and glorious thing a person could do is to go fight for your tribe, to defend your tribe. Okay. Also to them, there was no better way to die than fighting for your tribe. Like that was kind of the ultimate sacrifice, the ultimate act of bravery, which in a way you think of in the US today, when someone dies fighting for our country, it's pretty newsworthy, right? And there's like usually a huge military funeral, um, people from all over show up, even if they don't know the person. Um, a kid from my high school, not a kid, a man from my high school, he died in Iraq um, years ago. And they had his funeral at our high school gym because that was the biggest spot in town. And the governor came to his funeral, as well as like Harley riders from all over Minnesota, that that's what they do is when there's a military funeral, they do like a ride by and like they have a flag. Um, they had the salute, the military gun salute. I mean, it was, it was amazing because they wanted to recognize you know, him dying fighting for our country. Well, that's what the natives believe. And so they believe, like again, the ultimate sacrifice is for your tribe. Also though, you fight in battle to gain recognition. And one of the things you would wanna do is if you fight in a battle, is you wanna capture the enemy horses. Cause then you give, you provide for your tribe. Okay, whatever you can take from the enemy, you're going to. Over there. Oh, we're just gonna talk about scalping here in a sec. Hey, everybody. Hey, everybody. Hey, it's Rick Aaron. Hello, everybody. So the other thing you could do in battle was something called a coup, and coup is spelled as a French word, C-O-U-P. What a coup is is let's say I'm fighting. Okay, and I'm fighting against Zoe, right? She's the enemy. Like all of you guys are fighting around too because you're trying to kill you know, the enemy tribe. And so I'm against Zoe and I have a stick. I go up to Zoe and I touch her. Okay, I scored a coup. What a coup is, is you run up, you touch the enemy with your stick and then you run away. I didn't kill Zoe. And some of you, while I was doing it, you were fighting, some of you saw me do it. So you can vouch, like Sam Schmidt scored a coup. And then you tell everyone after the battle. I didn't kill her because what it showed everyone is that I'm that much better than Zoe. Because I ran up to her, I touched her, and she couldn't kill me. So it's like, the time, it's taunting is really what it is, is you scored a coup is I proved that I'm superior. And so they would have these things called a coup stick, not a coup stick, okay, that's music, a coup stick. And different tribes would decorate their stick differently. So I believe this is a, I think this is an Ojibwe stick, if I remember right. And so this must have been the Ojibwe, they put feathers for the number of coups. So like this soldier would have, or this, you know, Ojibwe um, fighter would have had maybe like, maybe there's two coups. I can't tell if that's two feathers or one, um, but they would have feathers to show how many coups they had. So if you're in a battle and you see the enemy, like if one guy's got like sticks on his uh, coup stick, then maybe that's who you'd want to take out because they were that much better than everyone else. So like the bravest thing, what? Yeah, right? <laughs> well, okay, here's the, like the end of the story is let's say I scored it on Zoe and I ran away and like I'm doing the rebel yell, you know, yelling that I'm not much better and you all witnessed it. Then someone else on your side could come in and take her out. And then, okay, so you score your coup, you show up, not done with Zoe. All right, anyone know what would happen to like 
the, the person that was killed next? No? Okay, I'm gonna tell you. They had scalp them. So scalping is what it sounds like. And you take a knife and you rip off the person's scalp. And then that's something else to show how many kills you got. Because when you go back, all right, I got you know four scalps, four kills. All right. Like, yeah, it might make you like a little easy, you know, to think about that, but there was a reason why they did it. Number one, personal recognition to show off. All right, which you know, that personal recognition, obviously, like people they join the military in the United States to fight for the greater good. But also, have you ever noticed like people in the military when they wear their jackets? They have bars and patches that all mean something. And so, or if they have like a purple heart or a medal of honor, they, just, they kind of deck themselves out the decor. That'll show, show personal recognition as well. So they did it with patches, all right? They did it with acoustic um, and then, you know, scalps as well, but they don't wear the scalps or anything. So anyway, why they would scalp too, not just to show how many people they killed is, the Native Americans had their own concept of heaven. They didn't call it heaven, okay? But all of you have maybe heard about or thought about like the idea of heaven before. Whether or not you believe in it, like that's fine. I don't care what you believe, but you know, like how do you think of like this afterlife or like maybe like this amazing place? Well, the natives had that. Their heaven, they called the happy hunting ground. They believed in the afterlife, their soul would go to this place called the happy hunting ground where they would be able to every day, all the time, be in nature and they'd always have a successful hunt. Because native tribes didn't always have successful hunts. Sometimes they'd follow the food and they would be successful. Sometimes they'd come home with nothing. So the belief was if you died in war, that was like your path to go to the happy hunting ground. However, if you got scalped, you didn't go to the happy hunting ground. If you got scalped, you would be left on earth forever. And you would be left, not like, don't think like a ghost that haunts people, but you're basically like your ghost would be on earth and you'd be walking around the earth and have no control over anything. So basically like, yeah, you'd just be observing and you'd be sad because there's nothing you can do about anything. And so they scalp their enemies to stop him from going to the afterworld, the happy hunting ground. Instead, wander the earth aimlessly and be able to do nothing. So that is also why they scalp. Yeah. So is it the afterlife that spot that Very common like amongst most tribes. Different lingo, you know, but that was something that, you know, there's obviously differences in tribes, but that was a very common thing. Just like how most of the tribes, you know, they treated kind of earth as their sacred space, you know, and like the sacred spirits of earth, like all of that is pretty, a pretty common um, thread throughout all of the tribes in America. Yeah, good question. <clears throat> um, because, okay, the bravest like thing to do was to die in battle. They were not signed to POWs. Like what's a POW? Prisoner of war. They treated POWs really, really bad, really harsh, because they looked down on them. How could you get caught and not die for what you believe in? Like you let us catch you, like how pathetic. So they would torture their POWs, which again, they've been doing that for generations. When they did that to Americans and they scalp Americans, that's when things are going to get a little bit contentious because you got Americans coming going like, what is happening? Like, look at, this is where you get the term, they call them savages. Like, look at these savages. But again, to Native Americans, there was reasons why they did it. Now, sorry, I just got stuck at the bottom. But the white man concept of warfare, I don't have a lot for you. They'd rather not go to war. That was a last resort. So they'd rather form a treaty, like let's make a deal. I already erased that list, but for the different time, like, I'd make a deal with them. Yeah, that's what they'd rather do. They didn't want to go to violence right away. Or like make a coalition, like we'll make an alliance. All right, we'll help you, you help us. 
They didn't necessarily follow the treaties or the alliances, but you know, that's what they said they would do. And then for number one on the white men concept, okay, why I put it like that? I don't really know how else to word it without making it super long. Pardon Mary, I think we get I just said she did anymore. <laughs> okay, so the white men, remember back in the Revolutionary War, uh, the Patriots used like guerrilla ambush tactics where they would hide in the trees and then surprise the Redcoats. Well, did they do that in the Civil War? No, they line up across the field and shoot at each other. So why is that like the U.S., they had tried hit and run tactics, kind of, but then they regressed during the Civil War and went back to the old ways where like the Native Americans, their warfare is based on ambush. Like they're going to attack, surprise, they're going to stop the enemy and then decide when to attack, then they're going to retreat. Okay, the U.S. had tried that, but they're back to their old battle ways. All right, and so instead, they'd rather make a deal and not have to go to war. All right, is everyone good on this slide? Okay, we're done with notes, but we still got a little more to talk about. All right, so before I go to that picture, the buffalo was the most sacred animal to any Native American tribe. It was really like it was their source of livelihood. All right, so what would they use the buffalo for? <laughs> everything, yeah, everything. Like what? <laughs> Give me an example. Go ahead, guys, one thing. Clothes, all right? They'd use the hide for clothes. What else could you use the hide for? Their teepees? Mm -hmm. Blankets? Didn't they use like their, if they had corn, they use them for them weapons? Mm -hmm. Yep, for weapons, for tools, mm -hmm. definitely. Very sharp. <laughs> they use the bones, yes, for tools also. You're forgetting like a really obvious one. Meat, meat, they would eat. Yeah, you know, that's also, yeah. Anything, anyone, anyone have anything else? I'll show you, you go. Okay. All right, so here are a few of the things in this graphic, what they would use the bison or the buffalo for. Okay, so obviously, like the meat they would eat. They would also eat a lot of parts of the organs. Um, they'd eat like the tongue, sometimes the brain, the heart, which have any of you ever had cow tongue before? Okay, yeah, like it's a delicacy, uh, actually. The stomach or like the bladder, they would actually dry those out. And they would use it like as a canteen to store water, you know, so like it'd be like a, a pouch that you could take with you when you go hunting and you dry it out and then you got your water and it would stay. Um, the brain though, know, they would also use to, in the tanning process, like tanning is when you dry out the hide. And so they would, so in the tanning process, you also need salt as well. And so your brain has like natural salt that they would use. Um, they would take the hair, well, they would take parts of the head for like headdresses for ceremonies, but then they would also weave the hair. Um, well, let's see, what was, what was that? Uh, oh, for pillows as well and ropes. And then I thought we talked about the hide, how you could basically use that for everything, like your teepees, your clothing, um, snowshoes, they could use that for saddles. I mean, anything basically. Hooks. Okay, you guys ever heard the phrase, but it's super insensitive, so I don't want to offend anyone, but like here, it's going to say, like, can I take the horse to the glue factory? Okay, well, they would use the hooves to make glue. Um, and then they would also sometimes uh, like shave off part of the hoof to make a spoon. So you could use it for drinking as well. Um, we did the stomach, the scrotum. All right, you kind of know what the scrotum is. They would dry that out. And then you could put little pebbles in the scrotum. Then you had a baby rattle. So yeah, who needs to go to Target? All right, just dry out an animal scrotum, scrotum uh, and there we go, rattle right away. Uh, yes, very pleasant. Um, let's see. <clears throat> okay, ligaments. I don't know if any of you guys have ever like gutted an animal and looked at the ligaments like by the bones. They're very, very fine. Like you can, it's almost like you can string them out. 
with like a knife or like a pliers or anything like that. So the ligaments they would use to make their bow straight because they were stretchy and they were fine as well. Um, so yeah, then the tail, like this part of the tail, they used for medicine to make different medicines, which um, it's interesting because that's something that's been done all around the world with different animals of using the tail. Unfortunately, in Africa, many tribes used to use a rhino's tail for medicinal purposes. That's why like, the white rhino um, has essentially become extinct. Um, but anyway, they would use like, again, like the thicker part of the tail for medicine. And then the rest of the tail, okay, if you got like cows or horses in the summer, what are the, why do they always swat their tails around? Get flies, so they use it as a fly swatter, just like why an animal would. Um, very clever. Um, or also a whip as well, which unfortunately, when you watch the movie, you're going to see a whipping scene um, that's kind of harsh and cruel to watch, but you know, it is what it is. And then blood, they would use the blood for flavoring to make condiments with their food. And then also for like paint, um, face paint for like going into battle or ceremonies that they would have um, as well. The last part, what are buffalo chips? It's a really fancy way of saying something. The poop, buffalo poop. All right, so you can use poop for fuel, right? All right, for heat. So they would burn it for heat. Also though, I really want to know how they did this. They would dry buffalo poop and then they would crush it up like into very, very fine pieces. I shouldn't be doing that when I'm talking about buffalo poop. <laughs> um, make jewelry. Yeah, then they would mix it. With... Can you? I spoke, yeah. Yep, yep. And then you uh, I get sure yes you could mm -hmm. it, I it. right yeah you just watched the YouTube video you didn't try it right no all right <laughs> yeah so like literally they need every part of buffalo even the part that leaves the buffalo's um body so what I want to show you guys today is a clip from the movie Dances with Wolves have any of you seen that movie it's really long when like, you're not gonna watch whole thing in class it's not Totally appropriate for class. Okay. How about you have seen it? Yes, yes. Okay. So I'll give you a little background then to the movie. It stars Kevin Costner, one of my favorite actors of all time. Uh, it's post Civil War. So he fought in the Civil War. And then his job after the Civil War is he's going to go to a post and he's basically supposed to watch this tribe because eventually the US military will get there and fight against this tribe, get them off the land. Well, Kevin Costner spies on him, and then it turns out he actually likes them, and he joins them. Uh, spoiler alert, sorry, that's like the Dances with Wolves um, part. And so there's a scene in the movie where they do a buffalo hunt. And so I'm gonna show you a good chunk of the scene. Um, it cuts out a little early, and I'll tell you what happens after that. But the great thing about this scene is this whole movie was filmed in South Dakota, um, because South Dakota still have buffalo, Today it was filmed actually on a on a farm, a buffalo farm. But anyway, a lot the movie takes place in South Dakota because South Dakota, like Minnesota, is very rich in Native American history with the Black Hills. So when they filmed this scene, they had one shot because what they did is they like induced a buffalo stampede, and so they had one shot at trying to get this scene right. I will tell you though, the parts where buffalo get shot. That's all computer generated. So there were no buffalo killed during the filming of this movie. All right, that is the fake part. So no one get offended, all right, by that. So anyway, I'm gonna show you the scene, watch, enjoy. It just gives you a little bit of an idea um, of how they hunted buffalo. And then unfortunately, if I try to stole this off of YouTube, the scene cuts out a little early. So I'll tell you what happens. Um, at the end of the scene. So yes, watch and enjoy.
Then after that, they take him to his buffalo and they take something out of the buffalo to give him to take a bite of. Anyone know what it is? Heart. The heart, exactly. So that's what natives used to always do. You get your kill, you thank the animal, you release the spirit. And so you take a bite of its heart, which I mean, a lot of people around here do that too with like deer hunting as takes. Uh, no, not you. No, I would rather not either. But like that's what I took from. Just to thank the animal. So that that's the part that got cut out of this scene on YouTube. So all right, cool. We'll be done for today, and then we'll continue at home Monday with the two uprising, and then Tuesday we'll talk about it. Yeah, I'm going to